So, um, do you prefer me calling you the delegate here? No. Okay. I don't. No. I prefer you calling me Borg. You're sitting <laughs> in my house eating my pie. Yes. All of that. <laughs> um, Hello everyone who lives in State District 20, Maryland, which means you likely live in White Oak, Silver Spring, or Tacoma Park. This video is for you, because we knocked your door, and you privately shared with us on a microphone what you wanted our representatives to work on. So here is the response back from one of your state representatives, Delegate Lorig Sharkudian. Yeah, somebody has talked about, speaking of schools, discipline in schools, and uh, I took that as like an aspect of social emotional communication yeah, or social emotional. I actually had a bill on that last year. Did you? Okay. Yes, I did. Yeah. Well, then, like, <laughs> all yours. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, um, the thing about discipline is what we have done in the schools up until now, and still, all of the, the tides turning, um, is what's, what people call zero, zero tolerance. So that kind of came into vogue maybe 20 years ago. And mm -hmm. um, exclusionary discipline that's focused on um, when kids do something wrong, kick them out. Yeah. Um, and that starts as early as preschool yeah. suspensions, expulsions, detention. Were you? Yeah, I was a bad boy. Yeah, in preschool? No. Oh. I was a bad boy as soon as I hit elementary school. Is that right? Yeah. We could, well, we could talk about <laughs> that too. Um, but what happens, and I'd be interested in your personal experience, yeah. is um, that does not, like what we want ultimately as a society is folks who know how to live in community. So if as soon as a child behaves like a child, frankly, because um, yeah. kids act out and kids mm -hmm. don't always know, I mean, how, how do you learn, right? Yeah. If as soon as a child does something that we find unacceptable, yeah we tell them they're not part of the community, and then they pop back in five days later, they haven't learned anything. They're not yeah. figuring out how to I be part of a community, right? So that's exclusionary discipline, and as mm -hmm. it turns out, it uh, leads to, it's part of, it has been part of the mm -hmm. expansion of the criminal justice system, mass incarceration, people call it the school to prison pipeline, yeah. um, and, uh, and it leads, it tends to be disproportionately students of color and students with disabilities mm -hmm. tend to be more likely to be, to have exclusionary discipline used against them. Yeah. Um, but it has a negative effect on, on all students and on the community that the students are coming and going mm -hmm. from, the mm -hmm. community, the school community. Mm -hmm. So the alternative uh, is uh, what we call restorative practices. And so um, the idea behind restorative practices is that you start with, you talked about social emotional learning, you start with like, having part of the learning from the very beginning mm -hmm. being about like what do we do with our feelings what do we do with our community how do we communicate with each other yeah. like stuff that actually turns out to be really important when you're an adult too mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. as important potentially yeah. as math um which i think is very important too uh <laughs> that's not to not to diminish math i think it's crucial but um but we also need to be able to talk to each other and deal with our anger and all those kinds of things and so um, but 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 the way restorative sort of practice works, it's it's a whole school kind of an approach, and it is a um, preventative mostly. It's about what we do to prevent mm -hmm. uh, kids from escalating, misbehaving conflicts from happening. Mm -hmm. But then it also is responsive, and so when kids get in fights, we give them a chance to mediate, to resolve their issues. Mm -hmm. We figure out what the underlying issues are. When mm -hmm. kids behave in ways that we find unacceptable. We sit them in a circle with others in the community who are affected so they can hear and understand how people are affected mm -hmm. and work on repairing the harm. So, so if a kid says something, he used the example of a kid. I, don't, I, I actually was not having this conversation. These were volunteers having the conversation. And he said, he just said, mm, mm, mm. I don't know what he was referring to that a teacher, that a child told the teacher or another student. Yeah. But if a kid said that, then you would have this sort of mediating practice instead of a discipline where he's kicked out of the community is what you're saying. Right. Yeah, and it's sort of big in small ways. Probably when he said, mm -mm -mm, whatever that was, whatever that was. <laughs> um, he didn't get suspended for that. My guess is Hopefully he didn't get not. suspended for yeah. that. But maybe. Um, but, you know, we put more and more kids. We talked a little bit about trauma, too. You know, a lot of kids are coming into school having experienced trauma. And if you've experienced trauma and then you act out because you've experienced trauma and then the response is that there's a police officer in your school who's now confronting you and then it escalates further, you see how like things escalate very quickly. Even like when we say, mm -mm -mm, probably didn't get him suspended, probably not, but maybe, you know, because yeah. then well, he's... Well, it could have escalated, like you said. Right. 
Um, so the idea is that um, you're working on understanding what's underneath. So like if a child is, you know, hurt people, hurt people. So if a child is hurt, if a child's experienced trauma, how do we address those mm-hmm. underlying issues? Mm-hmm. Or you're working on a very simplistic thing. You know, a child cheats, passes notes to his friend during a test. Um, now the te- now uh, we ask him, like, what, what were you thinking, right? And he says, well, he looked like he needed help. I want to help him. Uh-huh. So now we have to teach him how to help kids in a way that's not cheating, that holds on to the trust in the community, right? So in that case, this is one I'm familiar with, he goes and tutors kids. Like his I consequence, see. instead of his consequence ah, being wow. you leave the classroom, your consequence is tutor kids for two hours. Ooh, that's what wow, it looks wow. like to help kids, right? So think of how powerful that's that is, beautiful, yeah. right? Had he been kicked out of the classroom, for you know, gone to this detention, he loses his lunch, yeah. he's kind of, you know, t- thinks about how unlucky he is yeah. and then he goes right back to but now yeah. we're like oh you want to help kids let's show you how to help kids you yeah, want to cool. you know you feel hurt you, this is what you can do when you're hurt so and that was your bill sorry my bill was yes so my bill sorry yes was so i worked with the um commission on the school to prison pipeline i was on that commission before i was in the general assembly and that's available like if you wanted to share that with folks Very we cool. can yeah. find it online yeah, i'll yeah. give that to you um, and I, um, so my bill came out of that. It established restorative practices as the goal mm-hmm. for every, uh, every school, uh, in their discipline code. It required that they put restorative practices into their discipline code and it required the Maryland State Department of Education to provide supports for local schools to work in that direction. Now, realistically, it takes time and it takes money to kind of really build out a strong okay. program. So it's not like tomorrow. It's not like tomorrow all of a sudden everybody has this right, but it's the metric and it's the direction that all the schools are expected to to go in. That's cool. Yeah. I feel like that would be comforting for that person, but no, (laughs) that's cool. Okay. So somebody talked about, and it's probably going to click again at any point now. Somebody talked about ESOL statistics, disparities in school. Whenever I dive into the school data, I'm always shocked by it It, in some large ways. It is shocking. And this one was particularly shocking because I'm just going to call her P for now. She had, uh, she had said that. You know, she saw the statistics, and at that point, I don't think there were uh, clear statistics from 2017, because I just saw the data from 2017, 18, 19. Maybe she, when she moved back in, she didn't. See, this wasn't out, this Montgomery County data dashboard. But I did, I was able to filter between kids who are learning, uh, what is it, LEP, what does it stand for? Limited English Proficiency. L- limited English Proficiency. I took that as a pseudonym for ESOL as well. Yeah. And uh, the disparities were like, I mean, in Springbrook, it's, two seven, it's like 217 yeah. points or something. And the SAT scores um, of non-LEP and LEP students, and then at Blair it was 289. Yeah. I was like, that is a huge difference. Like mm-hmm. that means all the difference in all the colleges you will be applying mm-hmm. to, if at all, sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so there's a lot in there too. Uh, and I think the, the thing that I want to highlight. So what I will say is I think that the Montgomery County, the fact that that data is available now, the current leadership, uh, Superintendent Jack Smith, is committed to being fully transparent about the inequities and start to address them. So we're not hiding anything. That doesn't mean we've solved the issue. Yeah. We need to keep the pressure on. Yeah. But but it, but the data is pretty clear and it is out there and yeah. and we have to face it. So I just want to give him props for for that. All right, Jack. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, go, Jack. So um, the good news, though, is that this is the big year for getting education funding right in a way that addresses addresses these inequities. So you may know that the Kerwin Commission, uh, over the last two years, three years maybe, has been looking at how do we build a world-class education system in Maryland? Mm. And how do we do that with our funding, with our teacher training and uh, structures? How do we do that with accountability structures? How do we do that with, um, how do we build the state funding formula in a way that incentivizes what it is that we want to have as a reality in our yeah. in our school systems? Yeah. And a big piece of that is, um, and, and, and so specifically addressing equity is a huge piece of it. And then the other really big piece is college and career ready. And so making sure that every child when they leave the public school system is headed towards either, so career ready either through college or career ready directly. Mm. Um, and I think one of the things that has, has been problematic over the last couple of decades is um, that it sort of has been college ready or whatever, you know, has kind of been the choices and not, yeah, yeah. and not yeah. really college and career ready. So college and career ready, making sure everybody has, uh, has a path. Uh, and so, um, so that is going to, so, so in the next 
legislative session, so it's 2020 coming up, mm -hmm. um, we are going to have a huge responsibility as a um, General Assembly to get the funding right to fund the blue, we're calling it the blueprint for Maryland's future, mm -hmm. to fund that um, at the rates that are necessary to really address equity, to you know, have the sort of career path ladder mentorship with, for teachers, for universal access to pre-K, pre which is a big piece of it. Um, uh, community schools is a big piece of it. Schools with high yeah. concentrations of poverty, making sure that the wraparound services that are also necessary for students to be able to be successful, for their families to be successful, making sure those services are there. That's, that's a community, a community school. school. Okay, model. that's a new term to me. Cool. Yeah, check it out. It'll be I will, I will. in your liner notes. Okay. Um, anyway, so this is and this is a big year, and and I just I will just mention um, that uh, I know we're. Uh, the 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 um so that you know we have to find the money is the bottom line. I mean it's a it's a over the next ten years it's a couple billion more that we have to find and um and I'm fully committed to finding it and I think there's equitable ways to find it. I think mm -hmm. there's ways to do it with a millionaire's tax with combined reporting, closing corporate loopholes that multi state corporations manage to get away with, whereas in state small businesses pay their full mm -hmm. share of taxes, the multi states don't multinational corporation. So there's money there and we sort of have to have the political courage mm -hmm. to, to push that through. And it's a, and it doesn't mean that we'll see the solutions, you know, next fall. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the outcomes we won't see for a little while, but making this investment, getting this right now really will make, it's like an opportunity of mm -hmm. this generation. Like mm -hmm. it could make the, the massive difference in the sort of coming generation. So you don't, you don't seem skeptical that it's going to pass. So you seem skeptical that it, that or not skeptical, but that there is a, the, the, the work is of finding that funding then. Is that right? Cause like I, I heard, I've, I've read a lot on the current from Maryland, yeah. uh, Maryland matters. And it seems like there's a little bit of a political fight there. Well, so there's two issues. Okay. There's one is that the governor um, is actually raising private dark money for PACs to fight against funding education what fully. What a phrase. <laughs> it is, it is unbelievable. It's like, and when I'm like, when people say dark money, what they mean is money where people can contribute to PACs and don't have to disclose who the donors are. So there's people who, you know, presumably, um, folks who uh, are interested, uh, you know, I don't need, well, we don't know who they are, but people who are not willing to, to have uh, the, the state invest in, uh, in our students and in particular invest in a way that addresses equity. Um, and they are donating money so that the governor can use it to fight against this attempt to uh, fund education. It's ludicrous. Mm -hmm. um, and so... So that's happening. Um, the General Assembly will have to pass a bill to fund it. The governor may veto it, and then we have to override it. So that's that piece of it has to has to be done. I think some of the question is, um, and this is where I was talking about political will. Yeah. I think there's a full commitment from leadership and the majority of the General Assembly to do this. I think the question becomes. Um, you know where where we pull the pieces together. So then that yeah. that package hasn't been figured out. I see. Yeah. So you know, personally, I think there's a lot more that we can do with um, with these corporate tax loopholes, with a millionaire's yeah. tax, with an estate tax, yeah. with a um, and it is a it's a it's sort of a redistributive tax. Um, I'm not sure that all of my colleagues agree with me on that. There's conversation about. Um, legalizing recreational marijuana and then taxing. taxing that and that's potentially but the there's a lot of political issues that have to get worked out so I don't know I mean I don't I don't know exactly what it's gonna end yeah. up looking like I've looked enough that I believe the money is there and we can do it um, cool. the question of what pieces of it get put together yeah, yeah, yeah. and where the votes are for that I, mm -hmm. I can't mm -hmm. uh, I don't know and I guess I had one other question that I didn't even remember but I, I wrote are there ways you think community members can help to raise this gap? This is like the practical thing in the meantime question, maybe. Well, if you've ever seen any models throughout your mediation or state experience. That's interesting. Um, you know, I think, yeah, I think that um, I would suggest that people like get to know like the Montgomery County data and follow, you know, there's questions right now about... Um, Once you see it, you can't see it. Like, uh, Right. And there's questions now about redistricting, and I think it's really important for everyone to understand and be really clear about what those choices are. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we do know that, you know, there's a history of uh, 
this country has a history of redlining and directing um, students of color, just families of color into certain communities redlined, under invested in. So that's the, that's the hist- history of the country. And then, um, you know, you have the, the issue about homes and home prices and um, inequities in communities. And then when schools follow the inequities in communities, you're inevitably going to have these disparities. And, um, and, and so redistricting is, in fact, one of the ways, and that's one of the ways the county is, is looking to address that in the shorter term. And it's somewhat controversial. Um, And I think that that, uh, it's, you know, so what can people do? People can get to know, like, the details of what that really means and get to understand it and hopefully advocate for systems that are more more equitable. Okay, really cool answer. So mental health and pre-K then. Um, Mental health and pre-K is a, let's see, let's see what I wrote here. Uh, Some person was talking about funding mental health at schools, like counselors, psychologists. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then they also talked about pre-K, but we can talk about those separately. Yeah, so but then that's part of this package that we were talking about. So the the blueprint for Maryland mm-hmm. has, um, and the current commission recommendations, the pre-K, the universal access to pre-K, mm-hmm. it sort of phases in with people who have least access mm-hmm. getting access first, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Um, so that's a crucial piece of it. And then and it's aiming um, to cover everybody, or aiming to cover how much of well. Yeah, I'd have to look at what the. I'm not sure what the specific okay. uh, language is. Okay, I can put that in there. Gonna, that's fine. But but yeah, so the idea is that you're phasing in like initially, the lowest income kids who have the least access mm-hmm. to uh, a high quality pre K program, mm-hmm. and then over time, um, bringing everyone in, whether you are uh, funding um, everyone. I I don't know the the numbers of at what point parents okay. are paying for the pre K, like at what point in their income I see, levels. I see parents are paying for the pre-k but the idea is to make it accessible to everyone mm-hmm. um and then you said mental health as well it's also in- and mental health yeah yeah so school-based mental health that's that's part of the uh it's part of the community schools in the community school context you can address family-wide issues but mm-hmm. trauma-informed care um those kinds of things that's all sort of part of the um the bigger picture of what uh what that that builds so Kerwin is taking care of like well because when you look at like what does yeah. it take for students to succeed it what are all the all reasons that kids don't mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. okay, really cool do you think all of our schools will become community schools then in some way uh no usually because usually no, okay. you target community schools to like okay there's like a farms rate of 70 percent or something like that i see so okay. yeah yeah i see all right so then if there unless you have other things you want to add on education we can go. that's okay Okay, you wanted to end on your MGA note. Oh, oh yeah, so for folks don't know, the General Assembly session starts. So a lot of people, to your point, like don't necessarily know kind of what our work looks like. And so we have a 90-day session where we consider 3,000 bills, somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000. <laughs> bills? Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty awesome. Uh, okay. It's intense. But, uh, but here's what I will say about it. Because of that, mm-hmm. and we all have you know, one staff person, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. they're part-time off session, full-time during session. It's a, it's a ton of work and it is. And so what I like to stress for constituents is how important their involvement is. I think people think a lot about, um, the federal government, you know, that's, that's what we kind of see more in the news, but, um, people aren't always thinking about how much actually does get affected by state government policies. Yeah. And, States um, can guarantee rights. Huh? States can guarantee rights. Yes, and and people need to come and ask for what they want. So I'm thrilled to have this podcast. I also want um, mm. uh, would encourage people to uh, you know if they, if people were willing to get on my email list, um, I do send weekly updates of like what's happening in session. Weekly. What's going on. Right. It's at the beginning of the session, it's weekly, and then maybe it's like more like a week and a half. I was just, just <laughs> comparing the other we- updates I get from other legislators. Like, weekly is impressive. Just, just during session. Not just like people session. don't necessarily okay. want to hear from me weekly off session. I but see. during session, just because things I are mean, moving so fast. Thank you. My Facebook is for that. Um, but so. Um, but uh, so, but I also would encourage people to uh, just come to Annapolis. We do so District 20. We do a District 20 night, and maybe you could like let folks you know that you're connecting to. So we do District oh, 20 yeah, night, yeah. and I've arranged. Last year we arranged transportation, so some people drive, but then yeah. we also arranged like last year we did pickups in like carpools and stuff. 
Uh, we actually paid for vans to pick Incredible. people up. We had people up in White Oak, it's a pickup in White Oak, in Four Corners, and in Tacoma Park, I think is where we ended up doing it. You guys had and, a grant uh, for that, or you guys pulled your money? No, we paid for it. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We feed people, too. Okay. But it's you know, so come to Annapolis, and I think one of the things that I want people to see is just kind of how... Except, like, you should know where laws are getting made that affect your life, and say, come and take a look, and then people will come, they'll have dinner, we'll talk... And then um, usually we do it on a Monday night, and Mondays, Monday nights we have session at night, so people can then watch from the gallery and see like the session taking place. Yeah. And um, so that also any other time, if people want, can get themselves to Annapolis during session. My uh, office, is, you know, come say hi. And yeah. I have snacks. For everyone in my office. Do, Coffee. Yeah. I do, I do, yeah. That's yeah. good, yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, if people are interested in working on an issue they care about, it's like, I think it's really important. I think it's, um, I think that they're, you know, as with any government body, paid lobbyists and corporate influence, it's just very easy. You know, people have folks there full time doing their lobbying for them, yeah. and, and residents can also show up and tell their reps what they care about, but mm -hmm. it's harder to do that. Sure. And so whenever I have a chance to encourage people to do that, I like to, I like yeah. to do that. Come, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And we can also, like I said, uh, like you said, actually, and asked, it's, it's easy for us to give information at the door and just be like, yeah, you can take this right to them if you have something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so if, I'll give you some cards, actually. Yeah, we you, leave. yes, Welcome please. Welcome to yeah. hand people my card. And, and again, like as we talked about, some of the things are like county issues or whatever. I mean, we'll not necessarily have a solution to everything, but mm -hmm. we'll direct, we, won't, we won't leave people hanging. That's cool. Yeah.